it's like a there we go. Wall. <laughs> wall. What are we? Only oh, just a little bubble. Okay. Bubbles in the back. So <clears throat> today we are at our final class of this wonderful journey, journey of the soul. Sure, Fran, I can do that. Uh, that when we read, because we don't have the text up on the screen, we'll ensure that uh, those of you who are on Zoom will um, will try our best to speak loudly. And at the very least, I will uh, repeat the important text. So that way we don't miss those things. Now, this is a, a, a very interesting course, and I've gotten uh, tremendous feedback from many of you um, because it's a very important topic. However morbid it is, it's an important one. And I want to... Okay. Mark, you mind giving her some salt, sir? Thank you. Um, and today's class is dedicated by Joan Louise Fabro. And we are very much thinking of you guys. And we're hoping that Leah Pesha Bas Mindel should have a refuah shalem, a speedy recovery, so that she should feel good and that everything should go smoothly and you should get home safely and happily uh, without any unnecessary pain and discomfort to your family. Um, so this class, this final class, is dedicated in honor of and the merit of a speedy recovery for Leah Pesha Bas Mindel. Now, last week we weren't able to finish uh, the topic of comforting the bereaved. We spoke about a few other things connected to um, after death, what happens mm -hmm. to the soul, the actual process uh, in Torah that we know of that happens to the soul. But I didn't finish that topic, is what you do during the week of Shiva. A very important topic because I'm sure many of you have gone or unfortunately had to experience yourself uh, sitting through Shiva. And what do you do? What is Shiva? Besides that, we know that it's seven days. What is the mitzvah? What do we do for it? Um, so we're going to begin on page 190. Um, in our books, page 190, text 12. Again, this is just a very quick few minutes that we're going to finish this topic and move on to today's important and concluding topic. So again, this is talking about what happens, what is the mitzvah of Shiva um, for the mourner and for the comforter. So we're going to focus primarily on the comforter, those who are visiting a Shiva home. So Sam, do you mind reading uh, text 12? This is a text from Maimonides, from all the laws of Maimonides writes in his book, Mishnah Torah. The stage is, you want me to sit up here? Because, sure, because if you like. that might be better. Yeah, that may be better for those listening on camera. Here we go. The sages obligated us to visit the sick and console mourners. These are deeds of kindness that one carries out in person and have no limit. Although these are rabbinic ordinances, they fall under the purview of the biblical commandment to love your fellow as yourself. Leviticus 19.18. So for starters, Maimonides classifies this mitzvah of visiting someone who is sitting Shiva as a rabbinic commandment. There are actually some commentaries that believe it's a biblical obligation, not just a rabbinic enactment, mm -hmm. but it is a biblical obligation. But any way you look at it, it's a very important mitzvah to go visit those who are sick and those who um, have just lost a loved one and are sitting Shiva to comfort them. It's a mitzvah. Okay, so now that we know that it's a mitzvah, how do you comfort them? Right? Good question. And I'm sure many of you who have gone to a shiva home or who have sat shiva, unfortunately, know that a shiva house can be a little bit uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? There isn't, how do you break the silence? How do you kind of break the ice that it's not an awkward, uncomfortable situation? So the first principle of comforting is to understand that your, your, your presence is the most important part. 
showing up, literally just showing up and being present there for your family or for your friend that is going through that ordeal is one of the most important things. What you say, how you say is secondary to just showing up. Um, knowing that they have loyal friends, knowing that they have family or whoever it is that cares about them is already a very important thing for someone going through a very tough time, right? As we can imagine. Hey, Bob, you just close that door. Sorry. Exactly. Um, now, as mentioned, Shiva can be a little uncomfortable. It can be a little quiet when you walk into a Shiva house. Like, what do you say? You know what the Talmud says you should do at a Shiva home? Text 13. Now, I would have yeah. to know. If you start the Shiva with someone, do you have to do all seven days with the family? So, is your question, do you have to do all seven days, period? Yeah. Or do you have to do all seven days in the same place? Uh, all seven days to be shiva with the family. Or can you go alone or and sit shiva? just go for two days. There's no obligation to sit shiva the entire time to sit with the family. But there is a custom slash law that you should at least try to sit shiva for seven days. Okay. Even if it's alone at home, okay. that's also important. Um, as we mentioned in previous classes, that a lot of the Shiva customs have to do with the deceased, not even the comforting aspect. So that's a separate part of the conversation. But today we're focusing primarily on um, what you do at a Shiva home. What does the Talmud say? Uh, text 13 on page 191. Mark, last one you want to read out loud. The reward for visiting a home of mourning is for the silence. The reward for visiting the home of mourning is for the silence. Meaning that the empathy that's conveyed during these moments of voiceless people sitting there is the reward that you get for coming to a shiva home. Why do you get a reward? For being there. Not for saying anything. On the contrary, for staying silent. It's not just um, a tip, the Talmud says. The Code of Jewish Law tells us that when you go into a shiva home, it is a law that you do not open the conversation as the comforter. Um, as we see in text 14, Mark Moskowitz, read 191. The comforter may not say anything to avoid the conversation. Right. So only until they start talking are you supposed to remain sound. You shouldn't just stay sound the entire time. Um, so good question. Can you say hello? Yes, but you shouldn't start a conversation because until the mourner tells you what direction they're indicating they want the conversation to go to, you shouldn't start that. It shouldn't be your um, your conversation topic, your choice of what to talk about. It should be on the mourner um, so that we can act with sensitivity. Um, another few things that we don't do in, in, in a shiva home is that we don't try to make light of the situation. We don't try to lighten the mood. Um, sometimes, I'm, I'm sure some of you feel this way as well, sometimes when it's so quiet or so uncomfortable, we try to crack a joke just to break the awkwardness, right? Not our job to do that. It's on the, the mourner to decide how he wants, how he or she wants the mood in the house to be. Um, Shiva is not a party. Um, the Shiva is um, not to avoid the pain, but actually to process the pain. So obviously the mourners allowed to laugh at the joke that can come up in the conversation, but you're not there to do anything other than to help them bury this unresolved pain. Um, another thing that we don't do is that we don't try to philosophize at a Shiva home. I've seen it many times at a Shiva home um, where uh, people find the necessary time during the Shiva visit to philosophize um, the, 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 the philosophic response to death and to try to comfort them through that. That's not what we do. Um, our focus is solely in providing comfort. Um, again, sometimes people may be interested in that type of conversation, but again, that will depend on the morning. If he or she indicates that that's the conversation they'd like to take, 
by all means, follow their lead. Um, there are some comedy YouTube clips you can see if you go on YouTube. Um, what not to say at a shiva home or things people say at a shiva home. You'll 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 find it funny now, but it's actually sadly things that people say. People say things that you should not be saying at a shiva home. Um, uh, I have had people ask, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. right? Or were you there when she died? Did she die from the cancer or from the chemo? Like these are not things you have. These are not the conversations you have. Um, obviously, and we mentioned this last week as well. We're not here to compare losses. Oh, you're going through this when I was going through it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not our place to do. Um, what we do do, because I'm saying a lot of things we don't do. So what do we do besides remaining silent and eat. following what eat, eat? Okay, very good. Eat. Uh, definitely, that is a thing that that is a custom to have always food. The mourners are supposed to ensure that there's food for those that are comfort coming to comfort them. What do you do? What should you talk about then? If you don't talk about this, you don't talk about this, you don't talk about this. What should you talk about? Simple. You speak about his or her legacy and how you can perpetuate their legacy, and you can talk about how good of a person they were. Because again, we are there to help the mourner process the pain. So anything like that is totally fine. Um, we can talk about uh, the gift of life that this person brought to this world. Um, we can talk about drawing inspiration from his or her life, what they accomplished. These are all beautiful things that you can talk about. What they enjoy doing and what we can do to ensure that their legacy remains intact. Um, so again, these are all important things. I think that going to a Shiva home um, is something that we don't like doing because it's never comfortable, but it's a, a mitzvah, a very big mitzvah. Um, and it is a very special thing to do because a lot of times people sit Shiva in places that there aren't a lot of mourners, a lot of comfort, sorry, coming through the doors. And for us to be there for them is a very, very special time in their lives to be there for them. So anytime that you know someone sitting Shiva, that someone that you think that they will appreciate you coming, at the very least, if you're not local, pick up the phone, or if you need to, you can send them an email, a text message, but ideally something over the phone, FaceTime, whatever it is, to show them that you care. And if they're local, definitely try to show up to their door if, there's, if they're actually sitting Shiva. So these are different Shiva etiquette things that we do and don't do. Um, but I'm going to shift before we uh, move on to the next topic. Was there any questions about a Shiva home before we move on? Okay. Okay, so today's topic is a very interesting one, as many of the other topics that we discuss in this course. Um, this is going to be the, to the topic of, and it begins on page 210, the topic of aging, I know that sounds scary, aging, is death inevitable? And what is the Jewish view on resurrection of the dead? Right, it sounds a little bit lofty, resurrection of the dead. Doesn't sound like a real topic. So we're going to discuss that today, and it's going to tie back into a lot of what we discussed uh, during this course. So, until this point in the course, we've taken death for granted. We kind of view death as something that's inevitable, uh, something that we have no choice but to come to terms with. And we learned how to process it spiritually and the healthy way to mourn, the healthy way to grieve uh, the passing of loved ones. Today, we're going to take a step back and we're going to ask a simple question. Okay, we discussed that death is something that we have to come to terms with, but is, is death really something that's inevitable? Does death have to happen? Yes. It happens to everybody. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Is there a way to make it not inevitable? Well, if we could go, go back in time, it would be you yeah. know, a little longer. Why? Maybe What's back in time? Years. Back in biblical uh, time. Yeah, well, 90 years. Well, basically, so we're talking about physical death, actually. Spirit, oh. Specifically physical death. Yeah, I think eventually our bodies all wear out. Yeah. Okay. 
So if you guys think that there's no chance of, of staying alive forever, here we Could go. We go back to the time before uh before Adam ate from the the tree of uh tree of knowledge and the apple. Oh, okay. So that's gonna be a big topic right now, actually. As I said, I always love the the, the comments that that help us segue into the next topic. So here is a quick video that is going to help us understand. Here we go. Silver hair, noble gracefulness, mellowed insight. With all of the perks of seniority, people still prefer to be full of youthful vigor and naively trust that multiple decades of life stretch endlessly into the golden horizon. Wishful thinking? Would it help to adopt a name like Methuselah? The Torah sets the lifespan of ancient Methuselah, a patriarch of mankind's earliest generations, at a record-breaking 969 years. To be fair, a number of his contemporaries came tantalizingly close. Adam rolled in at 930. Canaan was set to rest at 910. Is there hope for mankind to climb back up the ladder of longevity? Or are we doomed to accept the appearance of gray as an inevitable hand on a limited biological clock? It's been obvious to me ever since I was a young kid that aging is the world's most important problem. In Meet Aubrey de Grey, Chief Science Officer of the SENS Research Foundation and the world's leading scientific proponent of engineering techniques to rejuvenate the human body and stop aging. But we are in range of turning, in, uh, turning out a solution at an exponentially accelerating rate. Dr. Gray is also a fan of biblical Methuselah and coined the term Methuselarity to mean a future point in time when all of the medical conditions that cause human death will be eliminated. It sounds fantastical, but in 2005, MIT's Technology Review, in cooperation with the Methuselah Foundation, announced a $20,000 prize for any molecular biologist who could demonstrate that SENS was so wrong that it is unworthy of learned debate. None of the submissions succeeded in proving that de Grey's theories were demonstrably wrong. At the same time, many of his proposals could not be verified with the current level of scientific knowledge and technology. And so, the question of lifespans rivaling Adam and Noah remains unsolved for now. Scientists aside, the best place to dig for insight into perpetual life is in something eternal. The Torah has remarkable teachings on the spiritual origins of the conditions that cause physical death. But do the Torah's ancient or mystical wisdoms consider the gradual breakdown of the human system fixable? Could the human aging condition as we know it be reversed? So it sounds pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, as we saw over here, this Dr. Aubrey something uh, argues that aging is a disease and it's a disease that we can find a cure for. Meaning it's not really inevitable. It's just circumstantially inevitable, but it's something that we can try to cure. Now, I'm not a a a a, uh, a biologist. And I'm not a molecule. What is it? Molecular, Molecular um, uh, um, expert in in aging and degeneration, but so, so therefore I can't tell you if this scientist knows what he's talking about or he's just you know, junk science. But what I am is a rabbi and I study Torah. And I can tell you that Torah has what to say on this. Torah has an interesting take on this topic. And we're going to talk about this topic today. Um, if our body breaks down, if aging, if death is inevitable. To uncover the Jewish view on the topic, what do we need to do? We need to go back to what Eric mentioned just a moment ago. We have to go back to the Garden of Eden at the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. So let's read text 1a. This is a quote directly from Genesis um, about the story of Garden of Eden, the Tree of Knowledge, etc. 
Sandy, you want to read it aloud? God commanded man, saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For on that day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So what we see over here is that there was a clear warning issued by God to Adam and Eve, saying that you should not eat from the tree of knowledge. Right? right? What is the punishment if they do? Dying. Death. What actually happened? Let's read text 1B. You sign, you want to continue reading? The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. And the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took it, took of its fruit and ate. And she gave also her husband with her and he ate. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and made themselves girdles. So as we all know, Adam and Eve didn't die. No, they they ate from the tree of knowledge, and they didn't die. What did happen? Their eyes were open to sin. And, and well, practically, the Torah says what actually happened? The eyes were open, and they realized that they need to get dressed. Yes. That's what happened. Yeah. So was God's threat an empty one? He said you're gonna die. And it turns out all they needed was to just put on some 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 uh some mm -hmm. fig leaves and to make sure that they're covered. That's that's the whole story. But they eventually died. They became mortal. Oh, very good. Who was that, Rebecca? I think that was Rebecca. Yep. Yes. So very good. So what what the commentators explained there, and Mark mentioned that here as well, is that what God was saying to Adam and Eve is not that you're actually going to die the moment you eat something from the Garden of Eden, from the Tree of Knowledge, sorry. Rather, that if you do eat it, you will become a mortal being. You will eventually die. Sure enough, after he ate the fruit, what does God tell Adam? Text 1C, Mark. Yeah, out loud. <laughs> By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For you were naked. You were taken. For you were taken there from the dust you are, and to the dust you will return. So what do we see over here? Very interesting. Death was brought about by the sin of Adam and Eve of eating from the tree of knowledge. Meaning... Meaning that death is not really something that was meant to happen. It what? seems like it's almost like a technical glitch in the system. They weren't supposed to eat. And if they didn't eat, we would all live forever. Correct. But that wasn't, um, there wasn't a clear warning about eating from it and, and, and there being a punishment from it. But it seems to be and, and and it's actually really interesting because you look at text two is that when, when we finally remedy the error of Adam and Eve and realize our true potential as human beings, there will be no more death. As we see in text two, a very famous line from Isaiah, God shall conceal death forever and he shall wipe the tears of every face. So let's figure this out. Up until now, the last five classes, we made it very clear is that... Um, Death is predestined. When someone passes away, we don't say that their life was cut short. On the contrary, we 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 say that they lived such a full life that they finished their mission at this age early. Um, and after death, we know that a person's soul lives on forever, his soul is eternal, and that they have the ultimate pleasure of basking in the presence of God in paradise, in the Garden of Eden. Basically, we saw that not just death is inevitable, but death isn't terribly bad, right, from the Jewish perspective. And here we see, no, death was never supposed to happen. Death was a negative thing. Right. It was a punishment to Adam and Eve that if they didn't eat, it wouldn't have existed, and it shouldn't exist. How do we know that? Because we know that when we finally fix their mistake, what's going to happen? What's going to go away? Death. Death. Meaning death is not really supposed to be there. So is death a good thing, a bad thing? What's going on over here? 
Are we trying to eradicate it? Is it inevitable or it's not? The answer is that uh, we'd have to know how to fix it. Okay, but as as if we do fix it, it seems to be that death is something that shouldn't have been there in the first place, and we just have to fix the mistake. On, on the other hand, we see many sources, as we saw in the first five classes, that death is predestined, it's meant to happen, and when it happens, it's not a terribly bad thing, your soul lives on forever, you can still connect. On the contrary, now the soul is free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these different topics. And here we see, what? what? So is that the good thing, a bad thing? What's going on? So how do we reconcile this? How do we reconcile this? So we're going to have to dig a little deeper into the story of the Garden of Eden. Because what does it mean that because of their sin of listening to, uh, I'm sorry, of listening to the serpent and not to God, did they suddenly become mortal beings? And I know, Eric, that you started speaking about this um, previously. I don't know if uh, you have some insight. Maybe you can help us figure out what is it exactly about the sin of the tree of knowledge that caused death to enter the human condition? Meaning, how did biting into a fruit transform the, the state of humanity in such a radical way? Anyone? Got me stumped. <laughs> so, we have to try to better to understand the nature of the transformation, what actually happened when they bit into that fruit. Before the sin of the Garden of Eden in the Tree of Knowledge, the body of Adam and Eve were very different than our bodies and souls. How so? The bodies of Adam and Eve were an extension of the soul. They were in sync, just like the body Sorry, just like the soul, the body was also selfless. The body and soul were trying to accomplish one thing together. There was no separation of there's a body and then there's a soul that's a godly thing. It was one thing. They were so in sync that there was no other being other than body soul as one. There was no conflict of interest that the body wanted to do one thing, the soul wanted to do another. And when they acted as one unit, that was only until the sin of the tree of knowledge. What happened when they bit into that fruit? Um, in, in text three, actually, we see this. Um, and I'll read this out loud. Text three on page 212. At that time, before the sin of the tree of knowledge, all of Adam and Eve's pursuits and all of their limbs were aimed solely to please their creator, not to engage in temporal pleasures. They viewed marital intercourse no differently than purposeful eating and drinking. They viewed their reprodu reproductive organs much as we view our mouths, faces, and hands. Right? Because everything was one, they had no reason to feel ashamed of their bodies. Their bodies, whatever they did, eating, drinking, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, intimacy, all of these things were all the same thing. It was all in sync because it was all to fulfill God's purpose in this world. What happened? What happened? And by the way, and that's why they didn't need clothing. Clothing was unnecessary. Wouldn't need clothing. Why would you be ashamed of having your body exposed? Your body is is a godly thing. Is that something to be ashamed of? What happened? The serpent persuaded Eve, Chava, to eat from the tree of knowledge. And it convinced her that she would gain new wisdom. What was this new wisdom that the serpent was referring to? Not that it would become smart, is that they would be that Eve would be wise enough and feel like she's her own person. She's not just a godly thing. There's another being here. Outside of its soul, the body. Once that happened, once this enlightenment happened, um, they realized, oh my gosh, we're naked. We have to put on some clothing. Suddenly their bodies were, were an actual outside existence. And they were ashamed of that. Everything they did suddenly 
wasn't in sync with their soul. There was a body and there was a soul. Thankfully, there were holy people, so they were very much in touch, in tune with their soul, but there was still a body. That didn't go away. Naturally, the consequence of that is, well, not death. What does spiritual death mean? Let me start from there. Spiritual death. Very good. Spiritual death is when your body and soul are not connected the way they should be. Is that the battery? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're detached. They become detached from one another. Um, just make sure the battery doesn't die. One second. Um, battery saver's on. Okay, I have to try to figure it out. Um, at least when it goes low. Um, when the body's values and desires and the soul's values and desires are not one unit. They're two different things. That's a spiritual death. Until the sin of the garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge, the body and soul of Adam and Eve wanted and had the same values. Same exact thing. Body and soul, okay, that happened to me. This was the body, this was the soul. But it was all one real big thing for them. The second they ate and they felt like the body is another thing, there was a separation of body and soul. When there was spiritual death caused and brought into this world, naturally that brought into the world as well physical death. The source of everything physical is rooted in spirituality. And the second spiritual death came to be, physical death came to be, where the actual body and soul are departed from one another. And the body remains a lifeless body, and the soul just goes back to wherever it came from. Okay, so now that we know what the issue of the Garden of Eden was, now that we know what is the real sin of Adam and Eve, and what, and what exactly happened, there was spiritual death, which caused physical death, and since then, death has been brought into the world. So we're halfway there, because we know that in order to cure something, you need to know what the issue is. So at least we know what the issue is. We know what the mistake was. The mistake was that there's a separation of body and soul. Okay? Now, we're one step closer to remedying the, the, the issue at hand, the sin at hand, which is the separation of body and soul. Okay. So what's going to be? What's going to be, um, before we get into how we get there, how we get to fixing that sin, let's take a look at what it will be like when death is finally eradicated forever and ever. Okay? Now, I'm giving you a heads up. This this, this um, section here may sound a little bit off the rails. It doesn't sound like even Judaism, and you'll be shocked to see how fundamental it is. So here we go. You see in page 214 in text 5, Right? Can you imagine meeting your parents, your grandparents, great grandparents, mm -hmm. all the people you ever heard of in your life, and being reunited with them? Right. So, as we know, the soul is immortal; the body ages and eventually expires. That we know. But as we just discussed, it's only because of a technical glitch in the system. It's not really meant to be this way. The body is not really meant to expire in the ideal state. The body and soul are meant to remain intact forever. And um, that separation of body and soul should not be happening. So in the future, the body will not become a body that ages. It will not deteriorate. It will not weaken. It will remain a healthy, strong body. It won't experience sickness or any of these types of things. Um, not just will death be abolished going forward, but all those who lived prior, there will be something that's called Resurrection of the dead. Now, before you throw anything at me, you're like, wait a second, what? Resurrection of the dead? Do we really believe in this? I'll tell you how much we believe in it. We believe in this so much that um, this is not just a cabal. I know, Fran, you've asked me this 
multiple times throughout the course. Rabbi, is this just, you know, in Kabbalah, this is just a Kabbalistic myth, or is this really part of Torah? I'll tell you, this is not just part of Torah. This is one of the 13 principles of faith brought down by Maimonides that is undisputed. Everyone agrees with 13 fundamental principles of faith. And the Rambam, Maimonides tells us, and by the way, th th these 13 principles are so important that many congregations have a custom to read from the um, to read from the Maimonides every single morning after prayers to mention these um, to mention these uh, uh, thirteen principles. Um, it's called the Ani Mamins. Ani Mamin. There are a lot of Jewish songs uh, called Ani Mamin. Ani Mamin Bemuna Shalema Reviat Hamashiach. Many many beautiful heart wrenching songs are connected to these words. And the final animam and the final, I believe, principle of faith is this animam. In that what? Here we go. Text five. Okay. Uh, but I have another book. Okay. Well, just, just, let me just read the text. I will stop there. Um, Mark Moskowitz, you want to read it out loud? 214. The resurrection of the dead is the foundation of the Torah of Moses. One cannot maintain a connection to the Jewish religion without this. Do you hear those words? Yeah. You cannot maintain a connection to the Jewish religion without this belief. That's how fundamental it is. That's crazy. Resurrection of the dead and the coming of Mashiach are so crucial to our belief that if you don't get this concept, you don't get Judaism. What was your question, Sandy? Okay. Now you're saying that the soul goes back with the ship and then it is it, it given to another person. When we're resurrected, who what does it go to? Soul? Great question. Very good question. And we're going to discuss that in just a few moments, how the process actually works. It's a very good question. Babe. And I'm going to focus on the question more to just kind of explain the question more to, to everyone participating. Yeah. You say resurrection, what does it mean? No, 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 I, I get it. It's a very good question. Um, but I am a little bit scared to lose my power here. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run just for a second, guys. Sorry. I'm going to run to get uh, the charger here. And then I'm going to... I guess the phone can be sort of like on a smaller scale. Can you move the table down a little bit towards me? Sorry, guys. Go. No, it's still not close enough. Sorry, we have to bring it even closer. There we go. Thank you, guys. That's what happens when you don't charge your computer in time. Okay. Now, talking about Maimonides, Maimonides was no mystic. Maimonides was a doctor. He was a rationalist. Um, he was an expert in the schools of philosophy. Um, and it is he, the Rambam, Maimonides, that selected these 13 beliefs of faith. And he's the one who deemed this the most central part of Judaism. You have to understand this in order to understand Judaism. Now, we're going to give a little bit of an overview of how this resurrection actually happens. But I know you have a lot of questions. If you haven't asked them yet, I'm sure you're thinking a lot of questions of what exactly is the rabbi talking about? What is this resurrection? So for starters, is when is this resurrection of the dead going to happen? Okay. Now, to understand this, you have to understand a little bit about the coming of Mashiach, which will be a separate course, God willing, um, in the future. But the Messianic era 
the resurrection of the dead will be the final stage of the Messianic era. The first stage is going to be the rebuilding of, well, Mashiach will come, reveal himself, and will rebuild the third temple in Jerusalem. That's stage one. Stage two is that Mashiach will gather, will gather all the Jews from around the world and bring them to our holy land, the land of Israel. Um, and finally, the last stage will be the resurrection of the dead. Now, that's a very, very important thing. There is a whole, if you look at the Talmud, you look at Kabbalah, there's many different things that the Talmud actually tells us how the process will work, how many years after so-and-so this will happen. So you're more than welcome to Google this after the class um, of how this timeline will work. But it's a very significant order. Just It's a very specific order. Um, now, who will be resurrected? This is going to touch upon your question as well, um, Sandy, is that number one, every Jewish life, every Jewish soul that ever lived will be resurrected. So good question. How does so so Sandy's question is it's a very crucial question. Is we spoke about reincarnation. Reincarnation means that your soul is somewhat recycled over and over again. And if that's the case, let's say a soul went into 10,000 bodies, which of those bodies will the soul go into when Mashiach comes? Right? So the question is a good one but it's based a little bit on a misunderstanding how reincarnation works. Um, because based on what we learned about reincarnation, there's no problem at all. And I want you to uh, to focus your attention on text six. Uh, this is from Kabbalah. We're going back a little bit to how reincarnation works so we can understand how resurrection works. Page 215. Sandy, you want to read? Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. If the first time a soul descends into a body, it passed away before it was fully rectified. At the time of the resurrection, the body will possess the portion of the soul it rectified while alive. Okay. Uh, when the same soul reincarnates into another body to complete its rectification. rectification and portion of the soul that was rectified in the second body brain will Verify the second body when it arises at the resurrection. Okay, that may have sounded lofty a little bit. Let me just explain. Yeah, thank you. The way, the way that reincarnation works is not that every single soul gets broken up into just a bunch of pieces. Think of it like a a spark of fire. A spark of fire can um, contains within it all the elements of fire and can grow into its own fire or like, you know, take a, a, a branch of a tree, which can be planted and to go into its own individual tree. That's the way the soul works as well. The soul doesn't get diminished because there's another soul being created from it. Every soul is made up of dozens of dozens of thousands, tens of thousands of different sparks within that soul. So when a person lives their life in this world, they are ultimately just a small, tiny fraction of a, of a of one of the original souls that lived during the time of the revelation at Mount Sinai, and it is our job to purify and to rectify anything that this soul still needs rectification for. Now, if that were to happen, having tens of thousands of souls connected to one body, uh, sorry, tens of thousands of bodies connected to one soul is not a problem. Because it's not it's not a contradiction. Yes, every soul can manifest itself in many, many thousands of bodies. Because it's just a bunch of sparks that regenerate itself based on the rectification the soul needs. So it's not it's not like a a consciousness that is all together at one time and, and takes a position in somebody's body. Well, it doesn't start out as one soul and then just sort of... No. Um, Each of us in our lifetime manages to accomplish certain things spiritually. That spark of the soul that you're able to rectify and that you're able to to um, um, 
that you're able to really do something special with, that element of the soul becomes yours. And that you could kind of call it yours. It's your part of the soul. And then when you're resurrected, that part of the soul revives you into, into your own. Completely revived. Correct. Correct. So one soul that's remaining that that comes after the resurrection, that one soul can be in several different bodies. Correct. Because whatever look, we're 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 people around this table, whatever you did or will do, God willing, for many years during your lifetime, and you will do, and you will do, and you will do during your lifetime, that part of the soul that you were able to 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 make a rectification and to complete that part of the soul becomes your, your yeah, part of the soul. Yeah, and that spark is what gets you to, to the final stage in the Messianic era. So one soul that has thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of sparks can, can manifest itself in different bodies. Well, I know. Right now, I'm sharing. Correct. Correct. There are no new souls since, and I don't want to get into the topic of reincarnation again too much, but we spoke about this during reincarnation where every soul needs to complete a full mission in this world, complete all 613 mitzvahs. And there are certain mitzvahs that can't be done by men. Certain mitzvahs can be done by women. Certain mitzvahs can be done in America. Certain mitzvahs can be done after the temple was was destroyed. Right. So there are many mitzvahs that need to be done by one soul. So all the 600,000 uh, 600, souls that were present at Mount Sinai still need work. Until we finish that, Mashiach can't come. We need to complete the rectification of all the souls for Mashiach to come. Why? We are. We can't do all Temple. Well, they already no, did. No, no, no. Then these are our souls that were created or were given to Jews at Mount Sinai, which Torah was given. So they were able to do all these things, and therefore, one soul can go into a man's body, into a woman's body, different time periods, to be able to accomplish what a soul needs to accomplish. Once a soul is done, it's put on the shelf. If soul one is done. We have six hundred thousand. So. Yeah, but then there's no end in sight, yeah, basically. Exactly. So this would signify that every person who dies still had to have more work done on their soul. No. Because every person is given something that they can do. You can't do certain things that a woman can do. Oh. However much you'd like to think so. And the same goes the other way around. Women can come. I'm giving genders as a random. But there are certain things that you in America can do or you and your group of, I don't know, in your society can do that you were able to do in your scenario. You growing up in, in, in family X enabled you to do certain things that someone living in, in Greece, again, I'm just making it up, wasn't able to do. So you were given this spark of the soul to ignite it and to make it, a, a, to rectify it for the soul. And when one passes away, that's the cue that you were able to finish your mission in this world. Okay. Now, where does the resurrection happen? All of the people, you're not going to um, um, have a bunch of people all over the world. Uh, all the dead will be resurrected in a land of Israel. Um, there's a whole calculation how it works if you're buried outside of Israel, but not for today's discussion. Um, now, how does it work? So we just spoke about that. Um, although the although the body, sorry, although the body decomposes, God will rebuild the same bodies that we had here in this world. So it'll literally literally be a a re a redo of this world without an end, without an end, with no death. Death will not be inevitable. On the contrary, there will be no death. Um, I, I know some people are probably thinking, one second, one second, one second. How many millions and millions of people, yeah. Jews around the world, will there be? Because who says there's even space for everyone? If well, we're talking yeah. about everyone throughout the generations, how, I don't know the answer to that. 
Um, I, I don't have a scientific answer, obviously. Because it won't matter so much whether there is enough food for everybody, for enough air for them to breathe, because we won't be mortal anymore. Correct. That's true in a, in a certain way, but I think the, the better answer is that the same God who created the world and um, created um, the creatures of the world and the resources um, that we need in this world is the same God who tells us that this is going to happen and that can create resources for all the millions and millions, tens of millions of people that live throughout these, the, the ages. I got one question. Yeah. Would you raise your hand? Um, what happened to the guy? Oh, good question. So there's a big argument in the commentaries if non-Jews will be resurrected as well. I, I would say almost the majority or many of the commentaries say no. This is only a Jewish concept. And number two, um, some commentaries say that it only applies to a group of non-Jews titled Hasidei Umot Olam, the righteous Gentiles which are people who, um, A, uh, kept the seven Noahide laws, and B, were righteous people. There's actually, in the Holocaust, museums, there is a, there's an award called the, the Righteous Gentile Award. Many Gentiles who were able to, non-Jews, who saved Jews during the Holocaust, went out of their way, even though they didn't need to, they put their own lives at risk. So we're talking about non-Jews who are extra special are included in this. So there's a whole conversation. There's no black and white answer there. This doesn't say anywhere in text, yes or no. There are different commentaries. There's Nachmanides, Maimonides, and all the great commentators. Hmm. Now, I'm sure everything that I just spoke about sounds quite crazy, at the very least. No, I think you explained it really good, because now we feel better about, you know, that one soul. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, I'm sure it goes beyond a lot of our uh, our, our um, rules of physics. Oh yeah. In second, our Jews always reincarnated as Jews. Always. Yes, always reincarnated as Jews. Um, and when it doesn't, it's a form of punishment, and it ends up in the place that it began as a Jew. Um, okay, so just to think of this from the theological lens, I think that um, it's going to be, uh, it's an interesting question, like, does it sound ridiculous, does it sound plausible even, um, that such a thing can happen? What do you guys think? After hearing what resurrection of the dead means, does it sound ridiculous to you? You can be honest, by the way. I don't, I don't think it sounds ridiculous because if we're here, <clears throat> then that means that we're here for a reason. And the reasons may change and so forth, but then hopefully God will um, give us other things to do. And so then I, 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 sorry, I, I and just allow us to exist wherever that may be physically on the Oops, earth. Oops, to the bathroom. So then the question really isn't if it can happen or can it happen, but rather why does it need to happen? What's the purpose of it? What's the purpose? What's the point of resurrection? For us to continue the work that hasn't been finished. It's been going on for the last few thousand years there's new people being created what's the point of the resurrection you can never do too much good suppose it's true but i'm saying what, then why do you need to re resurrect previous lives you can just continue creating new lives as that the last five thousand years has been um i don't know what's the purpose it's important um, to but maybe maybe because um they were never meant to die. Um, sorry, I'm not sure who's talking. I apologize. Oh, it's Elizabeth. I'm sorry. Oh, hi, Elizabeth. Hi. So maybe they were never meant to die. Okay, but that places quite the damper on everything we spoke about. 
if people were never meant to die, um, then everything we mentioned about the fact that that everyone's uh, mission is accomplished and that's when one passes away, that puts everything, you know, totally aside. But you well, were talking before about how everyone, how we weren't meant to die with, with uh, Adam and Kava. Correct. So on the one hand, we see that death was not meant to happen. But on the other hand, everywhere you look, all over Kabbalah, all over Torah, the concept of someone living a life in this world, <clears throat> death is not a bad thing. It's, it's, it's meant to happen. It's predestined. You look all over the Mishnah. You're, you're meant to be alive. You're meant to be dead. All these things are part of your journey in this world. So it's a little bit difficult, I think, to, to, to just say blanket statement that it wasn't meant to happen. Because we do see in many texts all over that it is meant to happen. Now, what does that mean, though? I think maybe the, the earth is such a small place. We're meant to expand to other areas as well. Think to other planets? Possibly other planets or other... What would that have to do with resurrection, though? It would mean that there would be a place for everyone. But again, everyone is, but then everyone. you don't need resurrection of the dead for that. You you can have people living on Mars today in 2023, 2024. You don't need to revive older people that are gone. So, what do you mean they're not dead? Their bodies are. Correct. So, correct. Yeah. I'm saying, why do we need to revive their bodies? Well, that's what resurrection is, though. And here we see the resurrection is not that the soul will be revived, resurrected. The soul never went away. What's going to be resurrected? The bodies. The bodies? What's the purpose of that? Maybe that's a reward. Oh, very good. Very good, Mark. When you do a mitzvah in this world, this is the, the, the simple answer. When you do a mitzvah in this world, how do you do a mitzvah? With your bodies. What what makes you do a mitzvah? Let, let's start with that. The soul. Our soul's desire is to want to do a mitzvah. But can the soul perform a mitzvah? No. It needs a body. It needs the body to do a mitzvah. When does the body, well, we spoke about a lot, about the soul getting a reward in the world to come. It's going to experience the ultimate pleasure of the relationship it forms in this world. Where's the body in this whole picture? The body worked very hard. The body didn't want to do the mitzvah, and yet it did it. Where's the reward for that? The body gets a reward. That it gets to live on forever. It becomes immortal. That's a simple answer. The problem with that answer is that if it's just about a reward, all right, so maybe God should have some fun after Mashiach comes for a month, make a vacation and a reunion of everyone, let the bodies be rewarded, and then send them right back to where they came from. What's the point of becoming immortal then? It can be just for a short period. It's about a reward. Oh, okay. So we're going to touch upon that right now. And this is going to be the concluding part of today's lesson. Um, and, and it's also going to explain why, um, how, how we get to rectify the spiritual death in this world. In order to answer this part of the question, all right, I'm, I'm not going to make everyone jealous, but let's see this. Here we go. Here we go. Very interactive. All right. So I have a sitter, a prayer book, my cell phone, a pushka, a tzedakah box, a charity box, and the last remaining, she's Danish. I'm sorry for those of you who are watching this. Yeah. That tastes very good. So I have four items here, a prayer book, cell phone, charity box, and a cheese croissant. Now, rank this from, from, from one to 10, um, or I guess one to four, one being the holiest, four being the, the most unholy. 
what would you guys rank the sitter? Again, holiest, oh. that's one. What would you rank the cell phone? Three. Okay. How about the food? A four, a four. I think a four is more likely what a phone can do. Um, a cheese danish. Ah. Um, where would you rank the charity box? Two. Two, okay. And where would you guys rank the cheese croissant? I guess number three. Okay. Why is this important? And I'll get back to this analogy in just a second. Everything we know in this world is made up of spiritual and physical. Everything. The, the physical part, the body of a thing is its physical existence and the soul is its spiritual existence, its purpose, its meaning, its true meaning. Take this cheese danish, for example. Sorry to make you guys jealous again. So I won't bring it too, too close to the screen. But <laughs> the body of the food, what's the body of the food? There's cheese, there's, there's pastry dough, there's the sugar, all these components, the smell, the taste of it, the pleasure. That's the body of the cheese danish. What's the soul of a cheese danish? I know, hard to believe, huh? Body experience. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca doesn't have to offer delivery if I keep, if I keep bringing it too close to the camera. Um, what is the soul of a cheese danish? What is the soul of a cheese? I don't. It's purpose. It's What's the purpose. purpose of a cheese danish? Nourishment. No. Nourishment. Give you energy. What was that? Nourishment. Nourishment. Yeah. Exactly. It's supposed to give you nourishment so that you can become a better person who can observe a mitzvah, study some Torah, be a better person, be kind. If you're not nourished enough, you can't do anything. You can't think. You can't act. And on the contrary, you act not good. You, you All these things, right? That's the soul of a cheese Danish. The purpose why is the soul, why is the cheese danish around? The body is, you know, for, for, for the pleasure and for the taste that it gives us. But we have the ability of eating a cheese danish for the body of it or for the soul, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we eat things that have no nutritional value, as earlier today, I have to confess publicly, I was noshing on some... Uh, um, gummies from Scandinavian swimmers are called from Trader Joe's. I was noshing on them as I was preparing the class, as you can imagine. The, the irony of me preparing the class while I'm eating something with no nourishment at all. And I was like, this is exactly the example of separation of body and soul. This is spiritual death. Something has no nutritional value. It will not make me feel better. I'm eating it just because it tastes good. I, I, I love how it tastes, I'll be honest. But it's not because it makes me a happier person, a better person. I'm eating it because I enjoy it. That is a spiritual death, straight up. Mm -hmm. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, this was the first time they disconnected body and soul. That's this right. was the first. Was, uh, he noticed that it was uh, very attractive. Exactly. She didn't think, oh, this is God's fruit. Like, yeah. This is a really juicy fruit. And she disconnected the body of it, the pleasure of it, the taste of it, and what will she'll, what she'll get out of it, wisdom even, but not because of the holiness of it, not because of the purpose of it. Our job in this world is to rectify the damage of that error. That's the error. Mm -hmm. And how do we rectify that? How do we rectify that damage? <laughs> no, no. So some people will say that. The answer is no, not to stay away, unless you obviously can't uh, meditate. But what's the way to rectify such a damage? To realign spiritual and physical. To take this cell phone that was rated number four on the list as the most unholy thing and to use this cell phone for something good. To make a bless. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Exactly. To take this Danish, make a brach on it, make a blessing on it, and use it to become a better person. That's realigning 
the body and the soul to become more in sync with one another. That is how we rectify it. It's not anything more fancy than this. It's simply taking a dollar bill or coin, putting it in a charity box, and giving it to someone who needs it. That's rectifying our error. What we do all the time is we misalign it. We make sure that the body is the pleasure of it, and we do things that we shouldn't be doing, and we forget about the true meaning. We have to make sure that everything we do and see, um, we're able to re to reveal the holiness that really is in it. Everything in this world, I mean every single thing. You can literally take this phone and make this a prayer book. Okay? There's apps. You can make it a, a, a prayer book, right? This sitter, this prayer book looks more holy. You know why? Because it doesn't conceal the inside very much because we know that it's a holy thing this conceals all the holiness so this is just more of a concealment the cheese danish is very tempting it's more of a concealment but this is as holy they're as holy they're all ones the charity box the prayer book the phone and the cheese danish are all equally holy just some are more concealed with their holiness and we have to work harder to figure out how to transform the spiritual aspect of it and some are less like a prayer book, straight up. It's a piece of paper, but it has holy words in it. So we have to work less hard mm -hmm. to reveal the holiness of a sitter, of a prayer book. So when we rectify the spiritual death, when we value something not for its external um, for its external properties, but for the ultimate purpose which it exists, that is the ultimate rectification of a spiritual death. I have a an odd question for you. So does a mista apply only uh, when you're doing doing things for other Jewish people, or does it also does it apply to everything else that's living? Meaning uh, plants, uh, animals, other people with other religions, and so forth. So again, just mm -hmm. explain the question. Sorry, I missed the the question of it. When, when you're performing the mitzvah, yeah. um, you're doing that for another soul. Okay. Um, as well as possibly your own. But does that work for non-Jewish people? Yes, 100%. Okay. And for they're just not people? commanded to do it. A non-Jew is not commanded to do those certain mitzvahs. Right. But there are the seven Noahide laws. And what they can accomplish with the seven Noahide laws is exactly what we can accomplish with the mitzvah. Hmm. The same concept. So if I go home and the rose bush next to my door, I have a conversation with it, try to make <laughs> it feel better about how chilly it is. Exactly. It's a good thing. There you go. It never talks back. So this brings us back to the final point here about resurrection. Um, because resurrection when we when we reach a point that we see the godly purpose in everything that the body itself becomes holy then there's no problem at all there's no uh, um, um, disconnect between the body and the soul and this merging of the body and soul is the actualization of the sinking of body and soul in this world when a person lives and is revived resurrected into their body and becomes immortal, that's the actualization, actualization of the sinking of body and soul, which constitutes actually the ultimate goal of creation. The ultimate goal of creation is that God wanted us in this physical world, in this specific world, to make this world, this physical world, a special place. So I want to just um, I mentioned before the, uh, the, the, the uh, on the one hand, this one and this, they say that Yanko was a very brilliant uh, young Talmud student. He um, he says, um, where is this? Let me just see. Um, so Yanko left his his shtetl to search for a wise one armed rabbi, rabbi with one arm. After many years of searching, he couldn't find the 
one armed rabbi, he comes back to his shtetl and his friend asks him, My gainful seriously, why in heaven's name do you waste so much time and effort looking for a one armed rabbi? The angel says, It's very simple. It's very simple because I wanted to have a teacher who would not answer my questions by saying, On the one hand, it's so and so. On the other hand, is this. I wanted to find this one armed rabbi who can never use him that on me again. So, on the one hand, I'm not, thankfully, I'm not a one armed rabbi, uh, or I don't know if by you guys, but thankfully for me, um, um, we learned a, a very interesting things about death. That on the one hand, um, death is not a very bad thing, but on the other hand, we, we saw today how death is not the way it's supposed to be because death means there's a disconnect between body and soul. And when we discover um, in today's lesson, the truth that death will be eradicated forever. Uh, once Mashiach comes, that is the actualization of what we're trying to accomplish in this world, of connecting physical and spiritual, body and soul. Um, so I am very, very thankful to all those who were able to bring this um, beautiful concept and topic, an important topic that is a very difficult topic, I would say, but is a topic that very similar to, to um, sorry, if, if you can just grant me one more minute. Um, there are three different types of mitzvahs. One of the mitzvahs we can never understand. There's one category of mitzvahs. It makes no sense. Like mixing wool and linen. We don't know the reason behind it. Um, the, 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 the red heifer, um, that we have to sprinkle the red heifer. If someone comes in contact with a dead corpse, they become impure, ritually impure. And to become pure again, they have to use a red heifer recipe. It's a whole concoction. Very, very difficult. And it's an irrational mitzvah. We don't know the reason why that works. Um, and even King Solomon, who's the wisest man, says that I understood everything in the Torah besides for the mitzvah of the red heifer. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, the Rebbe, in 1988, lost his wife. She was 87 years old, 86 actually years old. And it was a very, very difficult time for the Rebbe, as you can probably imagine. And after the Shloshim, the 30-day mark, the Rebbe's wife, Rebetzin, passed away, the Rebbe gave a talk. And he spoke about Moses, asked the question of God uh, about the red heifer as well. It says, I, I don't get it. How, how does it work? Like he said, his question wasn't, how does it work? There are many things we don't get how it works. It just, the Torah tells us that's how it works. That's how it works. What was Moses' question? His question was, when someone becomes impure, how does he get out of it? Essentially, Moshe's question was, when someone loses a loved one, how do they overcome their grief? There are many people, say what you want, you can take you know, beautiful courses, all the greatest courses, it's not going to make a difference. There's a, a gaping hole inside of them, and they can never get out of it, because grief is grief. Mourning is mourning. They lost someone in their life that they love. How does someone overcome such a terrible loss? That was Moshe's question. Yeah. Right? And Hashem's answer really was, he, Hashem was silent, as I said in Medrash, and what we realized from there, and the Rebbe was saying, you cannot rationalize death. This course was not here to explain why it happens, we just explain what happens, but the why, the rationalization of death, um, I, I don't believe there's any explanation that can ever satisfy the heart of someone who lost a loved one. And um, just like the red heifer, the rabbi said, the lesson we learn from it is that the Torah gives us power. We, we don't know where the power comes from, but we just know that we have the ability to um, to heal from such a loss without a rationalization because it doesn't make sense. Why we should ever recover, why Shiva should help us, why 30 days should help us, why the 12 months should help us, we don't know. We don't know. But the Torah gives us the strength. We don't know where it comes from, but it comes from the Torah. Hashem gave us the strength to overcome our grief. Not that God forbid we should ever, we should ever um, forget them, but that He gave us the power to overcome it if we need. Mm -hmm. And Hopefully, when will our hearts be completely healed? That's going to be with the ultimate redemption, with the coming of Shiach, 
God willing, speedily in our days. Um, I want to also thank those of you who um, dedicated classes at Alex and Jackie Cohen. I'll write this down so I don't forget. Uh, thank you, Eric and Monica. Thank you, Irina Kravtsov. Um, thank you to Sue DeVoe. Thank you very much. Um, to Michelle Deliso, to Phoenix, to Tracy, if I missed anyone, and to Joe and Louise, thank you very much for bringing this important topic to our community. And like I said, God willing, we'll be able to see our loved ones um, very, very soon with the coming of Mashiach. Um, I look forward to seeing everyone at our upcoming course that will begin in May. Um, the topic will be either by public feedback which topic I, I will give a multiple choice in our upcoming emails, um, or um, I may just decide if I don't get enough feedback. So looking forward to seeing everyone. And again, thank you for joining. And um, those of you who are around next Shabbat, um, yes, God willing, that is in the plans, Rebecca. A course about Mashiach. I'm going to have to plan it. I have to curate it. because It's not a simple course. Um, so you're, you're obviously touching upon a very, very important topic, but it's going to be a, a something that I have to prepare for longer. Um, next Shabbat is the only time in the year there's a biblical commandment to read the Torah um, on Shabbat, on the Shabbat pre, uh, preceding Purim. So uh, if next Shabbat, 23rd, 23rd, and it's going to be followed by um, a Kiddush, followed by the Megillah reading that night, followed by the Purim party that you must come very hungry and thirsty to. Uh, God willing. That's the one you, that's the one, that's the one that you go in an Uber. Yes, exactly. Um, God willing. That is uh, Sunday at Marriott.